All right. Well, I am Laura Scheidhauer. And just to tell you a little bit about myself and give you a little bit of background, um, I've been married for 34 years to the same wonderful husband. I have four adult children uh, who are pretty amazing and, and doing some pretty amazing things of their own. We have the cutest dog in the world. This little picture of him is not staged. That was, uh, he actually found a, a Tootsie Pop and unwrapped it and we turned around and there he was. So um, I've been doing team building for about 30 years, primarily in the education area and in ministry, um, but also uh, now working with corporations and, and different entities um, across the country. I was a choral music director for over 30 years. And so voices is my thing. And uh, the personality uh, assessments that we do are called the five voices. So I'm still doing voices, which is kind of fun. I love helping people to find their best self, to develop them and develop their potential into the best them that they can be. That's my passion, uh, always has been. And my voice order, if you were doing the five voices, was connective, creative, pioneer. And so that won't mean a whole lot to you in this particular session, but that's kind of who I am. And we've already already done a little bit of uh, just social socializing, getting to know each other a little bit. But if everybody wants to just jump off a of mute and just tell me something about, and maybe you're all from Calgary and you all have the same story, but um, tell me something that's special about your hometown. What's it known for? I'm from St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. And so we are, are known uh, for the Gateway Arch as the gateway to the West during the Western expansion. We were kind of a jumping off place for that. So that's one of our claims to fame, but we also have a lot of foods that are our claim to fame. Um, we have uh, fried ravioli that was invented here in St. Louis, barbecue pork steaks, which was here in St. Louis, the ice cream cone, and the hamburger bun, the hot dog bun. Are also you know, you want to follow. Um, so if anybody wants to jump off mute and tell me what is your hometown known for? Well, I guess I can start. So I'm from Calgary and um, we're, un you know, we're known for, let's see, the Calgary Stampede. So the greatest outdoor show on earth. And unfortunately, we're also really well known for some amazing steak and beef products and stuff like that. So that's, I guess, a big thing for Calgary. Cool. Anybody and from anywhere else? I'm from Calgary as well and born and raised. And what we're famous for the closeness to the mountains and Canada Olympic Park, a little mole of a hill that people ski on okay we're, yeah we've got lots of great activities in our grand backyard that's neat the pictures i've seen are beautiful so someday i hope to see it live and in person how about you barb where are you from Or Margarita? Uh, yeah, hi. I just turned on the meeting. Sorry, I was late. I had client. Um, I'm in Edmonton. Uh, Edmonton is a um, neighbor of Calgary. So also it's Alberta and it's green, green city, athletic city, lots of athletes and lots of stadiums and uh, small and open. Um, I don't know. <laughs> great, great. I love it. I'm, I'm living here for 20 years. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody else want to share anything about your city? If not, we will get started and, and just kind of move along. All right. So our mindset for tonight is that awareness empowers you to intentionally lead yourself and others toward positive actions and outcomes. And we're going to be talking about becoming a leader that people want to follow, not just the leader they have to follow. And so uh, one thought, um, and this was, I don't know who said this, it was, but I like the quote, random acts give you random results. And basically what that's saying is, if I'm not intentional about what I'm doing, I'm not going to get intentional results. So if I walk into the airport and say, I want to go to Chicago, 
and I just wander through the airport and go to some gate on some concourse and get on some plane and they make the announcement that we are flying to uh, Shanghai, China, I might be a little shocked, but that's the kind of results that I'm going to get if I just randomly walk through the airport doing random things, getting on random planes. I have to be intentional about where I go and the course that I take to get there. And our life and leadership really works the same way, that we have to be intentional about what we're doing. If we're accidental, we're going to get accidental results and not the results that we were looking for. And so we're going to look at three different tools tonight to help you learn um, how to be intentional in your leadership to become the leader that people want to follow. One is the tool we call you know, your, know yourself to lead yourself. Another one is the five circles of influence and then the support matrix challenge. And, and just realizing that awareness, self-awareness empowers you to make choices, to choose to lead yourself in a better, to a better direction and to realize that I'm not defined by my personality or by my tendencies or anything else. I'm not defined by those things. I have the ability to change that. And so if we're intentional, intentional means done on purpose or deliberately. So if I apply that self-awareness, it increases my ability to be an effective leader. And so we have to know our tendencies and then note the triggers that trigger those tendencies and the actions that follow them. And then we can lead ourselves in a better direction um, and away from taking the, the safety off of our weapon systems and, and functioning safely as a leader. When we're looking at our personality and our tendencies and our behaviors, we have to remember that there's three things that play into that. Our nature, and that's just how you were brought up, how your family operated, the other people and things that influenced you and taught you. And then, I'm sorry, that's our nurture. And then our nature is the hardwiring that is just right in us, uh, how you were designed, what is in your DNA, so to speak. And then um, our choices also, the thing, the path that we've chosen, decisions that we've made that influence our behaviors and our expressions of our personality. And that equals our leadership behaviors. And so when we're thinking about our leadership behaviors, we wanna look at the five circles of influence. And what these are is everything starts with ourself. Um, it's like the ripples in water. When we throw the pebble in the water, it ripples out further and further and how that pebble lands and what kind of a pebble it is kind of affects what those ripples look like. And it's the same with our behaviors. When we start with ourselves and becoming aware of who we are, and that's gonna impact my family, my marriage, my children, um, my extended family, even, you know, cousins and brothers and, and all those relationships. And then from that, it's gonna impact my team, my work life, my colleagues, and how I function within that group and how they see me and perceive me. And that's gonna widen out to the entire organization that I work with. And that's gonna widen out even further into the community and how, how I impact my community, what the community sees of me as a leader. And so it's being intentional about those things and in all of those areas so that we are consistent from ourself all the way out to the outer edges of, of the areas and people and groups that we may have influence in and not accidental in those areas. And then we're gonna kind of do a, a little bit of a um, deep dive exercise on the know yourself to lead yourself tool. And just uh, briefly looking at what this looks like, what this is, is we, we all have tendencies. Um, we have good tendencies and we have negative tendencies. It may be a tendency to get angry really quickly. It may be a tendency to be easily offended by others. It could be a tendency um, to pick your nose. I mean, it could be anything, but we all have tendencies. And those tendencies lead us to particular actions. And there's a trigger in here that creates that pattern of action. When that trigger happens, I'm going to take an action on that tendency. And so we want to see what, what is the action that I take? What do I do? 
And then all of those actions lead to consequences. You know, we, we teach our children that your words and your actions have consequences. Well, it's true in our life as adults just as, as well. And so those consequences then lead us to the reality that we're living with. If we're not happy with the way our life is, then you kind of want to backtrack and say, what, what are the consequences and actions that are causing this reality? And how can I change that? So it's know yourself, know what your tendencies are and, and the reality that they create, and then lead yourself in a better direction so that I can change those things. Once you know what your tendencies are, you understand that I don't have to be defined by that. I can change those tendencies and lead myself. Actually, it's changing the actions more than it is the tendencies to lead myself in a better direction. And to remember that I never graduate from the school of self-awareness. This is a constant thing throughout my entire lifetime. And then the last tool that we're gonna look at is the support matrix challenge. And in the support matrix challenge, we're gonna look at what it means to give high support and high challenge. And to be a liberating leader that is empowering people, creating opportunities for them to grow, to bring their best to the table. Or am I being a protector? We're going to look at in detail in a little bit here about what that means. But being a protector is that, that person that is bringing high support, but doesn't bring challenge or doesn't bring enough challenge to the situation, not holding people accountable enough. Um, protecting them in that if they're not doing their job, I may hint around at, oh, well, you know, um, you think you, you think you're gonna get that done? Uh, how, how's that coming? Is that coming okay? And, and I may even jump in and do part of the work for them to make sure it gets done, but I don't wanna damage the relationship. So I, I don't really bring the challenge that they may need to, to really empower them to be their best. And, and that creates a culture of entitlement and mistrust, or it might be, whoopsie, Where'd that go? There we go. Or I might be a dominator. And the dominator is the person that's kind of a bully, a tyrant. Um, and that's the way they lead. They, they lead by positional authority instead of by influence. And so that creates a culture of fear and manipulation. Or I could be an abdicator that I just, I don't care. I'm not bringing you high support. I'm not bringing you challenge. I'm, I'm just kind of waiting to be done. I, I, I don't, I, I've given up. Um, I might be close to retirement or I might just be discouraged and burned out. And so that creates a culture of apathy. If, if I don't care as the leader, well, why should anybody else care? If I'm not expecting anything of them, well, they're certainly not going to expect much of themselves typically. And so our goal is to learn to calibrate high support and high challenge in a way that brings liberation that frees people to bring their best to the table. And that's the hardest part of leadership. Most leaders never get there. And it takes intentionality. It takes intentionally spending the time and putting in the work that's going to figure out how each individual person needs support and how they need challenge and what that means for each individual because it's different for every personality type. Learning to make the donuts and help the other guy make the donuts at the same time is a difficult challenge. And so these are the marks of a person who is mature in their leadership. And by, by mature, we're not talking about, you know, the same way that we talk about maturity in, in you know, your behaviors, um, social behaviors so much, but it's the same concept that a mature, an immature leader is someone who hasn't really grown in their leadership. They're just doing what comes natural and they haven't learned the tools to grow and become something better. Um, they're just doing same old, same old, right? And so we don't want to lead by position that I'm your boss and you're going to do what I say because I'm your boss. We want to lead by influence. I'm your boss and you want to do what I say because you respect me and you know that I am working for your best interest and I care about you and, and the team. I'm not just for myself, but I'm for you and helping people to understand that you're for them in all areas. And we do that by managing our tendencies, right? Unhealthy tendencies, if we leave them unchecked and we don't learn how to manage those things, they lead to unnecessary conflict, to problems, 
and to a negative reality when I'm unintentional, when I'm unaware of what I'm doing, I'm unaware of how I'm leading and how it feels to be on the other side of my leadership, when I'm immature and I haven't grown in my leadership to know how to grow influence. And then when I'm overstressed or unhealthy, we're not going to look at all of these areas. We're going to just stick with these three on the top because we just don't have time to cover everything. Um, but that's what unhealthy tendencies lead to if they're not managed properly. And so then to create that positive leadership reality, we want to combat those unhealthy tendencies by becoming more intentional. And that's where we're going to use the five circles of influence to help us see how do I need to be more intentional? Where do I need to be more intentional? And then we're going to talk about how to be aware. Remember, we said that self-awareness means that I I'm aware of my strengths and my superpowers and know how to use them. And I'm aware of my weaknesses so that I know how to manage them. And we're going to use the, the uh, know yourself to lead yourself tool for that. And then normally we would also use something called the five voices, learning your personality traits and what goes into that. And then we're going to talk about maturity, um, the posit to have a positive leadership reality. I have to become more mature. And we're going to use the support challenge matrix to look at that. I also have to learn to manage stress and become a healthy leader in all areas. So take just a minute and, and either you can take yourself off mute and just throw it out here would be great. Um, if you're not comfortable talking on screen like that, uh, just go ahead and, and put it in the chat. But what is one of, one of your tendencies? Give me a positive tendency or a negative tendency. Overworking or a cheerleader. Yeah, that's good. What are some other tendencies? Great to so just react, second guessing people. Good. Overreacting. Good. So once we know what those tendencies are, a great way to use the Know Yourself to Lead Yourself tool is to begin to, to really log those tendencies. You can do it on a, on a, a spreadsheet. Um, you can just put it in a journal somewhere, but kind of beginning to log that these are my tendencies and even asking the people that are close to you and around you, what do they see as some of your tendencies? And do they see the same things that you see? Because what we find as leaders that sometimes what we think that we're communicating is not what we're communicating or how we're communicating it. So if you look at this, the first thing we're gonna do is figure out what circle of influence am I talking about here? Is this how I behave in my family? Is this how I behave on my team? Where do I see this tendency emerge? And um, that's one of the things that I really like about the five, uh, circles of influence is, again, we want to be consistent throughout all of them, but typically we don't. Um, we may behave one way with ourselves, but they behave another way with our family and behave another way entirely with our team or in the work environment. And so where is, is it that you see this tendency come to life the most? And what you're going to do is you're going to say, this is an unhealthy tendency. Okay. So we're going to say, here's what the tendency is, figure out what is the trigger that causes that tendency. And then what action does that cause me to take? What are the consequences of that action? And what reality does that consequence cause? And then we're going to go back and do the same tendency again, but we're going to do it in a healthy way. If I know what this tendency is, how can I change the trigger, think about it differently so that I change my actions, get a different consequence and a different reality? And that's the the leading yourself in a new direction idea. So if I were to do this, one of my tendencies, um, I have a tendency to take challenges or critique as a personal assault or a question of my competence and a threat into my idea or my, or my vision. So if I take it through this process, what I have is if I'm unhealthy and unintentional, I have a tendency to take those challenges very personally and, and not, uh, not as helpful, but as a, as a critique, a negative critique. Especially I feel that 
when um, someone is asking me a lot of detailed questions that are beginning with like, when are you going to do this? Why haven't you done that? Um, what are you going to do about those phrases are triggers for me. And then my action is that I tend to then push my idea even harder, trying to sell it instead of trying to gain collaboration from them. I'm just pushing my idea forward, trying to sell it to them. Um, I can get very defensive, given the appearance of being careless, that I'm not, I'm not interested in the risks or the problems that might arise from my idea. I just want to get my idea through. And then sometimes it'll cause me to take the safety off of my weapon and I can explode at somebody. What is the consequence that that leads to? It often most often leads to a, a less effective vision as I shut out others' views that could help me refine that vision and make it better. And I miss the opportunity to collaborate. And my personality loves to collaborate. I want to work with people. I love being a team player. Um, I like to bounce ideas off of people. And I miss that opportunity because I'm getting defensive instead of working with somebody and listening to what they have to say. And the reality that creates for me is that I lose buy-in from others. I make avoidable mistakes because I didn't listen to other people's ideas and insights into my vision. And I work without the support and encouragement from others. They may come along with me, but they're always going, well, I could have told you that was going to happen. You didn't listen to me instead of collaborating with me and fixing the problems up front. So if I, if I go to what would the healthy response look like, um, and I do this with my, my family and with my team, um, well, pretty much both, I guess. So again, it's that same tendency. So I change that trigger by changing what I'm saying to myself. Um, instead of hearing it as critique or a challenge of my competence, I change that to think, okay, challenges are really just opportunities for me to learn and ref refine my vision and make it better. So I remind myself, this isn't personal. The person is asking these questions because they really are trying to help me. That helps me to take different actions, to be more intentional, to take the time to answer their questions um, for myself so that I have the answers to what ifs and to help them get on board with the vision by listening to them. Um, I also listen so that I can avoid those blind spots that I can't see everything. I don't process everything the same way. I need those other voices and other input um, to help me see the areas that I have missed. And then messaging in a way that's gonna bridge the gap between their thinking and my thinking so that we collaborate together. What that produces for me the consequence of a better vision as the other voices help me to refine my vision um, and it builds meaningful collaboration so that I accomplish something bigger and faster than what I would have done on my own. The reality that that gives me is I've increased my influence. People feel a valued part of the team instead of shut out and others aren't fighting the vision but they've actually joined in with me. So that's kind of the process that we go through um, to know ourselves, to lead ourselves. And then we want to do that with each area of influence. What is the tendency I have in leading myself? What is the tendency I have in leading my family? What is the tendency I have when I'm with my team? What is the tendency I have in my community? Um, and that might be a sports team, a club that you're a part of, uh, your church organization. It could be, you know, any other place with your friends, um, those kind of areas. So again, uh, this is all applied learning because it doesn't do us any good to talk about these things and learn these things if we don't actually apply it to our life. Um, if we don't apply it, we're just an encyclopedia sitting on the shelf collecting dust. We're full of knowledge, but so what? It's not being used for anything. And so we want to give you a minute to kind of think through this for, for a second and choose one tenant so you can use the one that you've already mentioned, or, or if you had more than one in your mind, choose one of those and kind of fill out this process of how, how would I lead myself through this to be more healthy. So I'm gonna pop that back up there so you can see it, and then just choose one tendency and work through this process in it. What is my tendency? What's the trigger? What action do I take? What's the consequence? And then what's the reality? And what's really good about this too is we don't change our behavior. We're not going to put in the effort to change our behavior if we can't see a benefit to it. We make changes 
when we have a, a preferred vision of the future and natural next steps to get there. So this process kind of helps us to do that. We see what the negative reality is. And when we go through the healthy version, we see what the positive reality is. And, and then it's much easier for us to go, oh, I would rather have that reality. I think it's worth the effort for me to try to change this pattern of behavior so that I get this better reality. And this, the natural next step is generally pretty obvious once we've identified you know, this course of action. So take a minute and kind of uh, fill that out. And then I'm gonna have you um, share that with the group. I don't know if y'all have a piece of paper to write it down on or you can do it in your head, whatever you need to do. Then remember once you've done this version, do the second version of how would I change that to be the healthy version? What should my tendency look like instead of the unhealthy version? Okay, so would anybody like to share one of your tendencies and how you would walk it through? What, it, what problems does it cause you? And what actions do you take and how you might change that to lead yourself in a, in a more healthy direction? You can just pop yourself off mute and, and share. I know it makes you a little bit vulnerable to share negative tendencies, but hopefully we all learn together. Barb, I saw you come off mute, but we can't hear you. Okay. Um I didn't get to finish writing. I think I need longer to write things, but I'm hoping you can help me because I don't really know how to correct it. So, okay. Um, so I'm pretty new to management. So I thought this would be a good, a good session for me to attend, but I think my biggest issue is second guessing because I am new to it. Like my ideas, you know, like thoughts, like processes just because I'm not confident in that. So I don't, I, I forget what the other points were because I ran out of time, <laughs> but um, let me pop it back but, up there. Yeah, please, if you don't mind. Okay. So, I mean, I definitely think that's one of my, my actions that needs to be worked on. So, so what I don't triggers think it's particular. Okay. What trigger, um, maybe people just questioning me, even maybe just their body language kind of triggers me to think that what I'm saying is, I don't know, could be better. <laughs> okay. So, so it's second guessing yourself, not second guessing other people. It's yes. second guessing your own Myself. decisions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so what action do you usually take when you begin that second guessing process in your own head? I guess then I try to always like defer to other people. Like, like, does that make sense? Or like, I'll make comments like that. Or like, what do you think? Like I'll kind of pass the buck a little just because I'm not sure if they're on the same page as me or really agreeing with what I'm saying. And it's not that they aren't, I haven't really faced any, any sure. issues that way, but I just, yeah, I always feel insecure that way. Okay. And then what consequence does that create when you begin to question and you begin to ask other people, what do you think? What, what kind of a, a consequence does that have? I mean, it hasn't had a negative. I had to lead a meeting actually yesterday that I didn't realize that I was leading and it went really well, but I think I just probably didn't come across as maybe, you know, as confident or as, as I would have liked to. So I don't think there's any negative effects to it. 
because everything turned out fine and we collaborated. It went really well, but I definitely would have liked to maybe come across more confident and I guess well, that the preparation would be a, that would be a consequence it. that you feel like you didn't come across as confidently as you could. Mm -hmm. that, that would be a consequence. And okay. so what, what reality does that create for you? How do you think that affects your influence with the team? If they don't, if you're not coming across as, as confidently as you could, what, might that create in their minds as your reality? Um, they may not choose, you know, maybe to follow the deadlines that I set or, or the procedures that I wanted to put in place. If, if I didn't come across as like, you know, you know, this is what, what I think we should do. It's a good idea because without maybe demonstrating fully what I, that I was confident in, <laughs> in what I was saying. So. so do you think they have confidence in you if they perceive you don't have confidence in you? Um, I guess I'll find out next week if they actually did. <laughs> <laughs> and it's two people I've only met once before. Like it's not, it's not my regular coworkers. So sure. So it's that so made how... it a little more difficult too. So, yeah. So, I mean, because this is like a specific situation for me because I am new to it. So, um, I mean, I guess the reality is, is I think it ended that they, they did trust in what I was saying, but I guess I just didn't feel that way. Okay. So you still have doubts in yourself then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So just, uh, just maybe part of your reality is you're not sure how much confidence they have in you, but you don't, you still are insecure in your leadership and, and what you did there because of that. Would that be an accurate statement? Yes, that's exactly it. Yes, for okay. sure. And then I, I'm training people at the same time. And I, I hope that it's going well. But I guess it's always the second guessing. Maybe it's just because it's like not it's an immaturity in management. And that's why. Yeah. But. Definitely. It's, 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 it's something that's new to you. So you're, you're not going to typically step out and be like, you know, I've got this, I'm perfect at it when it's something. Well, yeah, you don't want to be like that either. Right? Like I know everything. Right. <laughs> so. right. So, so what could you do here in the trigger section that would be like self-talk to help you create a different action? What is it that you could think or say to yourself? I mean, I, to me, the triggers are typically a, a self-talk, you know, it's like, yeah, I guess it is really because no one had perfect. anything negative to say. So yeah, it, it's all me. Like it's all in my head for sure. It's not... Yeah. I, I don't know. I guess that's why I'm asking you <laughs> <laughs> or anyone else who can tell who maybe is more experienced in doing it to, well, what to give would, me pointers. <laughs> what would you, what would you say to yourself or because we're all different and so it's right. going to be a little different for for everybody what you what what will be effective for you may not be what would be effective for me um True. so True. what what can you change your mindset to be when you start feeling that insecurity creeping in where you're second well is this really the right thing to do is this really you know, did I, did I make the right decision here? Or, you know, did I handle this the right way? What, what would be something that you could change your mindset to that's going to help you to, to be more confident in yourself? Mm, I guess they wouldn't have chose me to do it if they didn't think I could do it maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, for, for most of us, that would be an appropriate thing to, to think. Um, how about, um, have you, have you been pretty competent in making decisions in the past? I would Is that say yes. something? Yes. Okay. Probably so yeah. can you, would it help you then if you kind of thought to yourself, Hey, I, I've done this before. I usually make pretty decent decisions or I've really thought this through. I've thought of the contingencies or I've thought, you, you know what I'm saying? Like I've, I've already thought this through and I'm, I'm, I really am confident that this is the right thing. And to kind of um, talk yourself through that, would that be something that would 
trigger you? To- I guess in my situation, I to know because our whole situation is very new to the company. So it's nothing that any of them have done before, I guess. So what have I got to lose really? <laughs> it's, it's not like I'm comparing myself to a past situation because it is brand new. So I guess I could look at it that way that, I mean, and, and I know other people will jump in and help if I have, like if I hit a roadblock. So okay, I guess I can so- keep that in mind too, that I do have backup. Yeah. Not left yeah. hanging. All those things you're saying are the things that you can say to yourself as that triggers. So if you're saying those things to yourself, what would be a better action and what action might that help you to take instead of that that questioning attitude as you're coming in? So if you're telling yourself, I've got people that'll help me. I've made good decisions in the past. I've thought this through and I think this is the right thing. They wouldn't have chosen me if I weren't competent to do it. You've told yourself all of those things. What action might that help you to take? I guess I could just present and without even making the comments to question myself and then just, you know, as normal, leave questions for the end instead of all the way through just always needing that reassurance I guess that it's like <laughs> that people are on the same page or agree with what I'm saying yeah I think that's good and it's it's never a bad thing to ask for others input in fact that's a really good thing a good right. leader is always going to listen to the other voices in fact in right. my example that's what I was missing you know when I when I get defensive I stop listening to other people's input and I need that input we all need oh, that okay input. but but I can I'm like the exact opposite. I take all the input to help me. (laughs) Well, and so there's, there's a way to ask for input where I'm asking with confidence, you know, here's what I believe is the right thing. Does anybody see any blind spots where I'm still, so I'm still speaking with confidence, but I'm also asking for your input and valuing your opinion. And maybe like you were saying, maybe save that to the end. I'm going to present, here's what I think. And then ask people. And I think that that will help you create a a consequence of coming across with more confidence. And if you're confident, your people are going to be more confident in you as well. Um, So that that's going to create that reality where it's going to get through to you a little bit too, that, oh, okay. And then give yourself the grace to know, especially in a new position, like you were saying, this is new to everybody. I'm not the only one that's, you know, new, new at this you're going to make mistakes. You're not always going to make the right decision. You're not always going to have the best idea and that's okay. You know, you, you own it and you fix it. And and if everybody understands that, that's a positive. And the reality that that helps to create is again, it, it boosts your influence because people understand that, well, she's made herself vulnerable to, to help us know that if I, if she makes a mistake, it's okay. That that means if I make a mistake, she's not expecting perfection of me either. No, right? True. And so True. and so those things actually help you as a leader to kind of boost your influence. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Does That's anybody how else, to be always? <laughs> does anybody else have any input that that might help uh, Barb a little bit there? Any ideas that? Anybody else want to share a tendency? <laughs> I appreciate you putting yourself out there, Barb, and, and kind of making yourself a little vulnerable um, with that. Thank you. Well, let's move on. We want to look at that in terms of all of our areas of influence, right? What are my tendencies with myself, my family, my team, my community, and how can I be intentional in changing those? And you may come up with more ways as you just kind of process, you know, these, these things and process the process, you know, to figure out what are some ways that you can, that you can help that and try some things. And if it doesn't work, then you try something else. Again, we all function differently. So what is helpful to me may or may not be helpful to you and your personality, you know, that may not be what you need. I I have a a sneaky suspicion just in the little bit of conversation 
that your personality is what we would call a nurturer. And nurturers never think they're good enough. Nurturers always think somebody else would be better for the job, no matter how competent they are. We all know you're competent. That's why you got the position you have. Um, but you will always look at yourself and say, huh, Susie could have done a better job at this than me. You know, so that that is a personality thing. And so you have to believe in yourself as much as we believe in you. They hired you for this job, gave you this position because they do think that you're competent at it. So in order to become a leader worth following, it takes time and it takes intentionality. And so as you start this process, you know, I would just say welcome to the journey that you've now started that um, for yourself. Absolutely. We are all uh, probably hardest on ourselves and our own worst critic and nurturers are more that way uh, than the rest of us. Um, which is, is just, it's one of their tendencies that they have to overcome in their leadership. So then we're gonna look at the support challenge matrix because to be a leader worth following, I have to look at how am I leading myself um, and then how am I leading others? And what does my leadership look like on the other side of me? What do other people perceive of it? And if you're really gutsy, you'll ask your family, you'll ask your coworkers or your team, to say, where would you place me in, the, in this matrix? And so we looked a little bit about, you know, really just quickly the high support and high challenge and how do I bring that? So let's look a little bit more in depth. What does it mean to be a protector? And so if you think of it like this, have, we've all experienced leaders in all of these categories and we've all been in all of these categories. Every one of us has done all four of these things in all four quadrants at some time. We may even do them all four in the same day, sometimes even with the same person. So I might be a protector at home, a dominator at work, a liberator in my community, and an abdicator somewhere else. Or I might be even within my family. I might protect this child, abdicate with this child, dominate my spouse, and liberate my other child. You know, it just... In, it depends on the person, the situation, you will be all of these things at some time. So a protecting leader is that person who really just cares too much about people's opinion. They're very relational. They're um, afraid if I bring too much critique, if I bring too much challenge, I'm actually gonna damage the relationship or hurt somebody's feelings and I don't wanna do that. So they care too much about what other people think. and instead of making decisions based on the facts. And so they tend to avoid hard conversations because again, I don't wanna damage the relationship and I don't wanna hurt someone's feelings. So then people begin to take advantage of them and have a feeling of entitlement. Well, it's supposed to be this way and you shouldn't be asking this of me. And they fail to hold people accountable. And that's where they'll jump in and do the job for them or, um, you know, give them more time and, and hint around, like I, I tend to be a protector if I'm not intentional. And so I'll kind of hint around at what I want from somebody instead of just point blank telling them, I'll say, hey, you know, uh, you're really doing a great job on this, but you, you think that you're gonna have this done by Friday? Is, is everything going okay? I hope everything's going okay. You know, and instead of saying, look, I really need this done by Friday, this is the deadline, uh, do you need any anything, any resources that you need to get it done? But this has to be done by Friday, you know? And I don't wanna put that kind of, well, they might think I'm being mean and so I don't wanna do that. Um, and so I'll just kind of hint around at it and that's not really helping them to get the job done. And then when it doesn't happen the way that I hinted around at, I blow up and, and explode at people. And so then people are walking on eggshells because they never know when is she going to blow, when are things going to go south, you know, and that's the protecting leader. And it, it's not creating empowerment. It's not giving people opportunity. It's not allowing them to bring their best to the table. It's actually hindering them from doing that. The dominating leader is the tyrant or the bully. Um, it's the leader who cares more about themselves than others. They're always finding reasons not to help other people, um, that they're too busy or whatever. They're the leader that is 
um, frequently is sitting at their desk in their office and someone comes in the office and they go on, they're typing and, you know, they're doing their thing and, oh, oh, hey, yeah, hi, how you doing? What, what, what can I do for you? But they're still doing their thing and, oh, wait, what, what, what did you say? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, be sure and get that done by Friday. And hey, oh, by the way, you know, I'm, my door's always open, I'm here for you. And they didn't do anything for you. They didn't help you at all. But their words and their intent was, hey, I'm, you know, my door's always open, anything you need, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm sure you'll figure it out, go, go do your thing. That they can also just be bullies and, and bully people into, hey, they're bringing the high challenge with low support. So they might be the one that's saying, you know, if you can't get the job done, I'll find somebody who can. Well, now you've pitted two people against each other and there's competition in the workplace instead of creating a culture of collaboration. And so um, it, it creates fear. Oh, I'm gonna lose my job. I, I'm not gonna get a promotion. I'm not gonna get a raise. I'm not, things are gonna go badly. I, oh, you know, and that creates a culture of fear and conflict and you begin to feel like a, a pawn on the chessboard instead of a valued worker who has a lot to contribute. And it's the idea of um, lighting a fire inside of someone versus lighting a fire under them. We can light a fire under somebody and they're gonna move away from the heat, but we haven't really created engagement and buy-in. They're, they're compliant but they're not really engaged in the process. But if I can light a fire inside of them, well, now they're excited about the process and, and they're moving ahead by it. It's like the steam engine. If I put the fire outside of the firebox, it's gonna create heat, but it's not gonna make the steam engine go anywhere. I've gotta light the fire inside of the firebox and then the steam engine will move ahead and actually go somewhere. And it's the same with us. You might even think of it like the, the uh, baseball coach of a little league team. Um, the kid is, is you know 10 years old and he's a catcher and the pop fly goes up and he misses it and he drops it. And the dominating coach is going to come out of the dugout and, hey, Tommy, Tommy, I need you to get, get your head out. Get that ball. Next time, I want to see you do better. You get that ball next time. But he didn't really give him any tools to help him do that. That's the dominating leader. The abdicating leader is the one that they either only care about clicking in and clicking out. They've done their job. They've done the bare minimum, or they're just completely burned out in life. They tend to be cynical, um, apathetic toward everything. They're doing just enough to get by so they don't get fired. A lot of times it's the person that is close to retirement and they're just done. They're done with the company. They're done with it all. They're just biding their time to get, get through it. Um, they can't or they won't offer help or support in any way. So they're not bringing challenge and they're not bringing support. They're just kind of done. And they fail to hold anybody accountable for anything. And that creates a whole culture of apathy and low expectations. If the boss isn't expecting it of me, why should I expect it of myself? Why should I go to this extra mile, right? And so they're not doing anything either. But the liberating leader, which is who we all, oopsie, sorry about that, who we all want to try to be is the one who knows and appreciates and values each team member, knows that each different personality has a unique vision, a unique way of processing information, a unique way of seeing the future, and has valuable things to offer. They're always seeking out new ways to understand each individual person and to motivate each individual person, understanding that each person needs something different from me, what support and challenge look like, to each person is a little bit different. They believe the best in people, but they also set clear roles and clear expectations of what they expect to be done. Um, and that improves productivity. It improves the, the joy and the happiness of, of being in the workplace and just a culture of empowerment and opportunity that I'm gonna be empowered to do my job. I'm gonna be given equipped with the resources that I need to do a good job. I'm gonna be stretched and I'm going to be given the opportunity to bring my best, to excel, and, and really help the team in, in my best ways that I can. And people, the liberating leader is looking at people as assets and not people as liabilities. And a, like a dominator or even a protector can look at people as a liability. Well, they're, not, they're just not doing their job. They're just not measuring up. The liberating leader is going to look at that person and say, what do I need to do to help this person? measure up and level up to the, you know, to what they are 
potential is. Um, and that's why they give both support and challenge uh, in a way that motivates people. Companies are filled with all of those leaders. Leadership and culture are jargon that we hear all the time. And the, you know level up is a, is a term we hear all the time. But what we're talking about is making it tangible and scalable so that you can understand it and you can get up to that next level, so to speak. Um, if you look at the difference in a dominating leader and a liberating leader, um, dominating leaders are leaders that others have to follow. They're the empire builders. They hoard resources and, and uh, underutilize the talent. They make decisions that showcase themselves instead of the team. They're autocratic. Uh, they drive results through manipulation and fear, creating a culture of stress and low engagement because people are just afraid to do anything, afraid to offer their ideas, they're gonna get shut down, afraid to try something new because if it's a mistake, they're in trouble. Um, they're egotists focused on self-preservation and self-interest and not what is best for the team or the organization. They're decision makers that make decisions without the collaboration of the team or the interest um, of the team that reduces buy-in, that hinders innovation and it decreases productivity overall. Or they're, and they're overseers. They over control, presuming incompetence and imposing punitive measures for, for perceived under, bleh, sorry about that, underperformance, um, stifling people's growth so that people don't have the opportunity to try new things and to expand their horizons. But a liberating leader is a leader others want to follow. They're people builders, they share resources and celebrate everyone's contributions and talents. They're multipliers, they take their health and their leadership and they multiply it into those around them, which drives the results through high support and high challenge, creating a culture of opportunity and empowerment. They're influencers, others, they're other focused, others focused leaders who are fighting for the highest possible good of those they lead and building relational trust in their teams. They collaborate, they utilize the unique strengths of team members in decision-making, creating engagement, innovation and alignment and they're investors. They're intentionally investing in people to unlock their potential, give them ownership and establish psychological safety, creating growth in the team. So we really don't have time to do the little sharing that I was hoping, but think in your own head, um, who is someone that was a liberating leader to you? Hopefully you've had someone like that in your life and what characteristics did that person exhibit that helped you to feel liberated, that you could bring your best to the team. And then the idea is to go back to the five circles again and say, how do I lead in each of these circles of influence? Am I a liberator to myself or a dominator to myself? Am I a protector to my family or am I, and you can go to each individual person in your family and say, am I a liberator, dominator, protector or abdicator? And when do I behave that way with that person? Do it for your team, your organization, your community. How do I lead in all of these different spheres? Now, as leaders, you can't give what you don't possess. If you can't lead yourself, you can't lead them. If you can't know yourself and guide your tendencies, then you can't expect them to do the same or help them to do the same. People are looking at you for leadership. And if they don't get it, they're going to complain and they're going to gossip about it. It's going to create a culture of conflict and not harmony. So your action plan is to pick out that one thing that you're going to work on this, this week or this month to be a liberating leader. What do you need to do to do that? And then look at what mountain is it that you're climbing? I don't mean what is the next position you want or the next title that you want, but what is the journey that you're on? What are you trying to do right now? And with whom are you trying to do it? What's the objective that you're trying to get people to? And where are you on that journey? How how are you as a leader and, and helping your people figure out how to get to that next level? This is really not where the journey ends. This is the beginning. Self-awareness is where we start our journey and you never graduate from the school of self-awareness. You're always learning new things about yourself. And as you make these changes in your tendencies, you're gonna find new tendencies. They're always there, they never disappear. So I hope that this has been really helpful to you in looking at leadership maybe in a different way or taking a new look at some things that you're doing and tools to help you in your journey. Anybody have any comments, questions?
I think it's a lot of information and it's totally got me thinking too. So I know I'm sort of in this moment of um, kind of disbelief and processing. So I don't know how much I can go into, but it's, it's amazing just the different ways to look at all the different approaches that people have to being leaders. So thank you so much. Seriously, it was wonderful. It is a lot of information. And, and that's why I say, you know, take it away and, and take time to process it, but then be intentional about what you do about it and find places and ways that you can definitely apply it um, to your leadership. And, and we're all leaders, whether we lead a team or a company, we all lead ourselves. We may lead our family. We may lead our children. We may lead a whole, a whole organization, but we are all leaders in one form or another. And so thinking about your leadership in, in different ways is, and we could honestly, we could spend, you know, an hour on any one of these tools and just really talking through and um, processing it. But I kind of wanted to give you an overview of, of how they all fit together and, and layer on top of each other. Um, if you're interested in, in taking it further and learning a little bit more, I am forming a Sherpa training group in September. They'll begin in September. It's all on Zoom. So just like this, you would join from, uh, from your own home or wherever it's convenient for you. Typically, we meet during the day, whatever time is, is good for the people that have joined uh, the group. It's learning along with other leaders who have the same commitment and desire to grow that you do. You're on the journey together. And so you learn from me as a coach, but then you have the benefit of also gleaning from the insights and experiences of others. So if you're interested in being a part of that group uh, starting in September, you can call me, email me um, and ask questions. I have a whole little video and thing that kind of walks you through. What does that look like? What do you have to do? How much does it cost? All that kind of stuff. I don't want to take the time uh, to do that here, but if it's something you're interested in, um, do jot down my contact information. Um, oh, shoot. I thought I had my uh, email on there. My email is bmore, one word, bmore, at uh, the lhsconsulting.com. Um, that's also my website, and there's information about the Sherpa training group on that as well, but it's bmore at lhs-consulting.com. So feel free to call, email, whatever um, works for you. And uh, I really have enjoyed the opportunity to share with you and hope that it's been beneficial to you as well.